Pick one, Farquhar on rocket skis. Farquhar surveyed the mountain peaks below him, assessing the cornice and crevasses between himself and the lodge below the wispy clouds that all but obscured his vision. If all goes well, he'd be sipping Bombay gin with a splash of quinine in the next hour, surrounded by admirers by the crackling fire, all wearing trendy sweaters with snowflakes and reindeer they had bought at J. Crew or Abercrombie and Fitch for the occasion. He looked back at his native porters, shivering in their loincloths, toting the six dozen cinder blocks he demanded they each carried up the mountainside. While he reclined on their backs during the arduous journey up the 20,000-foot elevation where he now stood, the porters wrapped duct tape around his feet, securing the 13-foot-long Tyrolean rocket skis to his feet. Farquhar took a long draw on his pipe and reminisced about the time he was yak hunting in Portugal. It had been a wash, as he later learned there were no yak in Portugal. He did, however, come back with a large stock of port wine, which proved handy for trading with natives from time to time. He really preferred to trade in 16-pound cinder blocks, which he could always promise thousands of them to the native porters upon completion of a successful whale hunt in the Sahara Desert or finding rattlesnakes in Antarctica. Farquhar had the good fortune of almost never having to pay his porters the 500 cinder block bonus, as most of them perished before the expeditions ended. So now with his goal 20,000 feet below, Farquhar put it on his polar goggles, attached the oxygen mask, and called out to the lead porter to light the fuse. The porter, fearing for his life at the end of the 13-foot Tyrolean rocket skis, duct taped to Farquhar's size 13 Tommy Llama genuine snakey in boots, fidgeted with the Zippo lighter that he had taken in trade for 16 cinder blocks on a previous expedition from another Sherpa who was convinced the cinder block was a valid world currency. He quickly lit the two red fuses on the back of the skis and stumbled backwards off the cornice, causing an avalanche. Farquhar waited impatiently as the fuses sputtered and emitted large clouds of smoke. At last, with a deafening roar, Farquhar was soon seen flying towards the lodge, lying supplying grabbing his pith helmet and leaving a trail of sparks across the mountainside. The rocket sputtered and went out after about ten seconds. Farquhar was spiraling it through the air towards the lodge below. Meanwhile, several groups of fundamentalist Christians out for a revival ski weekend were buried alive in the avalanche caused by the nervous porter. Rescuers recovered a Zippo lighter and grave PTF, which they mistakenly believed belonged to the pastor Tom Franklin, who had perished in the disaster. Mourners at the pastor's funeral were confused when they viewed the body. The undertaker, not knowing much about him, had placed a rosary in his right hand, a zippo in his left, and a cigar in his breast pocket. The pastor had never smoked or drank in his entire life. Meanwhile, Farquhar had drifted down and crashed through the lodge's skylight, killing the twin Norwegian bartenders when they were impaled on his skis. He called for a Bombay gin and quinine. His call for a Bombay gin and quinine fell on deaf ears. The Norwegian twins were the only ones certified to score Farquhar's triple axle and three-point landing. Sadly enough, it never made it to the record books. There was a crackling fire as the lodge burned to the ground, but nobody was around to hear Colonel Farquhar's heroic tale. To this day, there are cinder blocks marking the spot of his attempt. After 16 days on the peak, Farquhar's porters had stumbled down and found a ski patrol hut, where they had their frostbitten fingers and toes amputated and were each given a cup of hot tea.